Razer is primarily known for littering desks with PC peripherals, keyboards, mice, headsets, speakers, etc. However, they pumped out a couple of gamepads in their day, such as the Raiju for PS4, and some wired Xbox controllers, the Wolverine Ultimate, Tournament, and V2 Chroma, and some projects that never took off, like this obscure bad boy. But without a reasonable doubt, this is the most hyped or anticipated product from Razer in a long time, at least since I've had a YouTube channel. But I don't blame you, the hype, the anticipation is well warranted. This hyperspeed wireless dongle should provide a much faster and consistent wireless connection than Bluetooth right? The first pull, the first run out of the gate. I guess we'll be testing that in this video. And I'm sure since this is a $250 controller, it includes a very nice carrying case and a ton of included accessories, right? So Razer had a fantastic opportunity to remedy previous mistakes that I pointed out. Okay, well, I'm sure Razer has taken a bunch of feedback over the last few years on their previous controllers and made some revisions so they don't make the same mistakes twice. Right? And that is when a good warranty system comes into play. Ooh, Kevin, you're getting me real nervous here in the intro. I got one of these on pre-order, and this is a $250 controller. Please don't tell me you don't like the thing. Some of the components in this controller are pure gold. I've praised Razer in the past for their mecha tactile, marketing gimmick name aside, mechanical switches, which feel fantastic and are rated for 3 million clicks. Yep, that's in the face or action buttons, the touchpad, the eight-way D-pad, and these extra bumper buttons. If you're ready, I'm ready. Let's cock our fingers at an awkward angle and get early onset arthritis. This is your controller, Captain. We've reached 6,900 feet. Go ahead and start flicking the sticks and mollywop in the back paddles. Mm, you don't like back paddles? How about those rear buttons? We've, We've tested, tested almost 100, 100 custom and premium controllers, controllers, and we're only at the beginning. You need a thumbstick guide or tutorial on how to overclock your controller? Check out the controller playlist. Bing bong. Controller Captain out. Packaging and included accessories, my expectations are very high. And that is for two reasons. In my experience, Razer has very premium packaging, even on their entry or budget level products. This comes down to keyboards and mice, as well as heads sets and controllers. And the second reason is this is a $250 controller. There's her face. There's the Tukus. If you want to pause the screen to read some of the key features on the box, you may do so now. As expected, you do have some laser cut foam top and bottom, keeping your controller perfectly in place. You do have a nice little cutout for your finger to easily get your controller out. I like that convenience factor. You do have a couple of thumbsticks up top as well as the dongle hyperspeed wireless. Other than the two short concave sticks that are pre-installed on the controller, which are very wide, by the way, we'll talk about that during the thumbstick section. You do also have a short dome stick, pretty grippy, nice rubber silicone compound. And then you also have a high, but really it's like a medium or mid-rise concave stick over here. So Razer had a fantastic opportunity to remedy previous mistakes that I pointed out with the Razer Wolverine Tournament, Ultimate, and Proma V2 Ultimate Jumble name, all of which I've reviewed on the channel, and all of which included this exact suite of stock thumbstick caps, which is not great. There is no high option here. You know, I'm getting ahead of myself. We have an entire section of the video for the bumbles on table here. In this bottom tray or trough, go ahead and take up your finger. Don't need to grease it up or anything. Put it in the hole, pop this out. You will have your included USB-C cable, which is very high quality. It is branded with Razer on the USB-A and C side. You also have smoked dust covers, which I love to see. They also fit very snug and have a little bit of a resistance when you install and remove them. I've actually never seen that before. You do also have a little lime green pop in there as this is a licensed Razer product and that is their theme color. You do have a rubber tie back that does stay connected. Oh, that ain't it. What the hell? This is short as, this is, sh good golly, this is short. This is like shorter than my wingspan. Okay, well, good thing this is a wireless controller because this is a shorty, about a three, four footer, but it is lightweight and flexible for the times you will need to be charging this controller or if you want to go wired to the PC. This would be long enough to plug to the front of my tower here. And then you have an instruction manual pamphlet or brochure. It's a long skinny boy and you have a little blue stamp or sigil letting you know that this is a licensed official Sony product. And then of course you have the marketing slogan for Razer, for gamers, by gamers. Stickers fall right out. It's not an official Razer product unless you got those holographic stickers. First thing you're gonna see is a thank you letter from the CEO. I don't think this is his hand signature on each and every instruction manual, but pre-printed on here. And it basically just tells you that you're gonna be slapping around the competition because you've bought a damn near $300 Pro controller from them. And of course they have their socials if you need to get in contact because you're having any issues or you wanna give them any praise publicly about how kick-ass their controller is. I'm genuinely really disappointed with this instruction manual because traditionally Razer has had very good manuals. They aren't this skinny boy. Actually, a couple of their mice did use this long skinny design, which 
It's not the shape that really irritates me. It's just the lack of information or the information's a little bit clum clustered in there. And also there's no full color pictures or well laid out diagrams. I'm just not a huge fan of this. Luckily you don't need the instruction manual because you have this video, which will go far deeper than any uh, piece of paper sh shall or should or would or could. I'm all about minimizing paper, but your safety and regulatory guide, your warranty information, your instructions, as well as a jumble of other languages. This is just like a D minus for presentation. Can we take just a moment to acknowledge the fact this is a $250 controller with no included carrying case, yet they do include loose accessories. Speaking of included accessories, only four included thumbstick caps, while competitors usually include six, sometimes even eight, looking at you, Hex. One of the worst instruction manuals I've ever seen. But the stickers are cool, I got nothing bad to say about you. And even the presentation with the box was pretty underwhelming for Razer products that are even cheaper. Now, as far as manufacturer weight and dimensions, that's gonna be popping up on screen somewhere in this general vicinity, far enough away from my face for general safety. But that's just numbers specifications, if you will, giblets on a tech sheet. But when flesh meets plastic and we start talking about the actual ergonomics of this controller, how it feels in the gamer palms. It's a story that we've been read before because it is virtually identical in front faceplate and rear shell as the Wolverine V2 Chroma, which makes sense because this is the Wolverine V2 Pro. It's in the same family. Now from a glance or even more than a glance from even two feet away, these look identical. They really aren't. And the Wolverine V2 Chroma, which is a hundred dollar wired Xbox controller I have reviewed on the channel, previously is actually a little bit more comfortable because if you look at this measurement right here, it's actually shaved in a couple more millimeters on the Xbox controller. The reasoning for that being there is a lot more internals that have to be packed in to the Wolverine Pro, which is a wireless controller, not just wireless. It's also hyperspeed wireless, which I'm sure has some pretty hefty internals on the board. So it's a little bit bulkier in this bottom section, not giving you a place to really rest your middle fingers, quite like the cutout or notch inside of this wired Xbox controller. But you definitely notice that it is more chunky in this region here. Oh man, that actually is detrimental. Damn, it's not terrible, but it certainly is not comfortable. Other than that, the rubberized grips are virtually identical to the V2 over here, which is a good thing. These haven't broken down. They're not the most comfortable thing in the world, and they also don't provide the most grip, but they are pretty durable and rugged in the long run. That's good. This just honestly isn't a very comfortable controller in my opinion, and I've had my hands wrapped around a couple controllers in my day. A monumental amount of gamepads or controllers over the last couple years. And I also listened to a robust community of almost 70,000 individuals. And with all of that foundation about what makes a comfortable ergonomic controller, this simply isn't it. And perhaps this will grow on me like the other Wolverine controllers have, but uh, no, I don't, I don't really believe so. <laughs> but you do have Chroma RGB and that really redeems nothing at all because I usually turn it off because you can't see it anyway because your palm rests over almost all of it except this section right here. Four inch RGB strips. You can see one and a half inches of it. I did like the RGB on the original Wolverine Ultimate because that was around the touchpad. That looked classy and sassy in my opinion. As you can tell, I have my dancing shoes on. I was kind of tiptoeing around the next section or segment getting ahead of myself and that is gonna be cosmetics or appearance. If it is a custom controller, that meaning it is one of the companies that has a builder online where you can spec out a controller and customize each individual component. Then I share my screen and we look on their builder and grade that. However, with these pre-built controllers, one size fricks all, this is what everyone is going to get. And in my opinion, it looks pretty darn good. It's got that two-tone white and black thing going on, kind of a Stormtrooper armor design. I like that. Also, I like the touchpad. It's got the Razer logo emblazoned on there with a bunch of dibbly dots. And it is mechanical, very clicky. Entire section about the accessory buttons later. Beauty is entirely subjective. It's in the eye of the beholder, if you will, but these corneas see this as a four out of five. I think this is a pretty good looking controller. As for build quality, it's not the prettiest thing in the world as you do have a relatively large panel gap between the front faceplate and the rear shell. The rubber grips that they've been using on the last few generations of Razer controllers just feel incredibly cheap. The 3.5 millimeter headphone jack looks like something grabbed out of a parts bin special, but having gotten those little jabs and hooks out of the way, the overall package is pretty good. The controller doesn't have any creaks or moans and groans. And because damn near every button on this thing is mechanical and tactile, it just gives you that perception that this is a very high quality product or this is built different than the rest. As it is, this is not spec'd from a stock factory OEM Sony DualSense controller and then customized from there. This is built from the ground up from Razer. And you really do get those vibes that this is something different. Is that something better? I just don't know. I'm gonna land it as a 3.5 for build quality. As for a quality control reputation, Razer is primarily known for their PC peripherals, keyboards, mice, headsets, etc. However, they do also pump out some game pads. And I haven't heard a whole slew of complaints about them absolutely disintegrating. I would say probably 5% of Razer controller owners have some type of issues in the lifespan of ownership. And that is when a good warranty system comes into play. Now, unfortunately, as someone that uses a lot of Razer 
Razer peripherals in their PC setup. Their keyboard and mouse have been my daily for like three years, and I use their headset for about a year as well. I will say their warranty is absolute trash when it comes to PC peripherals, keyboards, mice, and their controllers is no different. Actually, one of the smallest numbers on here. I will say that one year is better than the six months we're getting from Hex Gaming and Scuff. That's also better than the options that we're getting from Battle Beaver and Evil, where you have to pay for an additional warranty that still kind of sucks ass. It's definitely not the lifetime that we're getting with AIM. Granted, that doesn't cover stick drift because it's not their thumbstick modules, but that's just not great, especially when you're spending $250 on a controller that could develop stick drift at any time because you're using potentiometer thumbstick modules rather than magnetic Hall effect sensors. But because of that, that's just a tough pill or anything to swallow. I'm going to give quality control reputation and warranty a two out of five. As for the D-pad or direction pad, you're going to have to excuse me. These Razer controllers have never sat quite right in my stand, so it's kind of whoppy jot in there. These rear buttons, weird looking and feeling. Anyway, D-pad, pretty nice. It is those mecha tactile mechanical switches, so they are rated for 3 million clicks. Same thing as we're seeing in the face buttons over here. And it is an absolute buttery joy to use. If you're a fighter player, you play a lot of beat-em-ups, this would be great for you because you can do roll-offs like nobody's business because it is, it almost feels like it's one piece, but that would be a bad thing. You don't want it to feel like one piece. It is clearly eight distinct steps, but they happen so rapidly. Just feels amazing. Also, cosmetically, I think it looks pretty good. As the one with that hybrid design, so you have a wheel as well as a four point. I love it. Five out of five. There might be a little trend today with five out of five categories. Let's continue that. Face or action buttons. Amazing. Mecha tactile switches rated for a tap life cycle of three million clicks. Now, why do I rave about razor face buttons so much? I have in the past. I, I will today and I will in the future. Well, before I give you the legitimate reasons, these things are the bee's knees and the mule's nips. Okay. Haven't gotten that out of the way. I just have to get it out of my system. I apologize. First of all, cosmetically, they look good. They went with a gloss white design with some gray lettering, which I think looks really good. Not lettering, uh, shapes. It's a PlayStation controller. Also, they're raised quite a few millimeters out of the front shell to where you can cleanly hit them. They are also large enough and spaced out far enough to where I have no issues whatsoever. Granted, I don't have very big meaty thumbs. But since these are mechanical switches rather than rubber membrane switches that have a rubber plunger under the front shell, these not only will last longer, but they're also faster to actuate. So as soon as you press them, it is registering that input. And also from a user standpoint, in my opinion, and also this seems to be the consensus with a lot of gamers that have tested these type of buttons, they're a lot more common confidence inducing because even if you have your speakers very loud or you're playing with a headset to where you're not going to hear anything from your controller, you get that nice tactile click on your fingertips to know that you did indeed hit the button. It is actuating the switch for you. So they feel better, they last longer, and they're also scientifically faster to actuate. Sick. Five out of five right there. Ran out of fingers. In all seriousness, just so you know, I'm not giving out five fives like they're candy. I have praised Razer for about four years on their face buttons, and this continues the trend. They're an absolute joy. I told you there was a trend with five fives today, and that ends here. We're going to give a 4.5 out of five to the accessory suite. So things like the touchpad, the PlayStation button, the mic mute button, and the share and options button. Well, the touchpad looks great, as I mentioned during the cosmetic section, but it's also that mechanical switch. And you can activate it from the left side, right side, one of the corners, so it doesn't have like a weird pivot point or anything. The PlayStation button is also oversized and front dead center. Mic mute button as well as the share button have a nice distinct click. My only complaint with share and option is I wish they were a little bit further out of the front shell, making them a little bit easier to hit. Four out of five. Notice for the thumbsticks, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not a huge fan of the included accessories. You do have two pre-installed concave sticks, which are medium rise. They're pretty damn short though. Very reminiscent of what you get with a stock controller. Then you have a short dome stick, which is what I'm going to run on the left. And I do like how these interchange or how you swap the sticks. They are magnetized like what we get with the Microsoft Elite and all previous Razer controllers. So they're not just plastic and held on with friction. They're actual magnetized metal, which feels good. And you have to line them up with a little pin or prong in there. So you can only slide them in one way. On the right, you already know I'm going to go with the highest option available, which really isn't that high as seen here. And I don't need some stick that's like a skyscraper that leaves marks on my ceiling or anything like that. I don't need to look like I'm grabbing grabbing the shifter on an 18 wheeler. I prefer more leverage when I'm playing first person shooters so I can bump up the in-game sensitivity a couple of clicks and have that precision finite movement. 
I'm just not getting it here. Also, some of that is because these anti-friction rings are rather large. So when you are at full lock on the outside of the thumbstick gates, you're not really moving that analog stick as much as you're used to, or at least it doesn't feel like you have that same range of motion. I don't like that at all. But moving on to a happier note, the two included sticks that I do prefer to run, the short dome on the left and the high rise on the right, actually feel really good. The rubber silicone compound they use is very grippy, very comfortable on the fingertips. And I do like how wide that right stick is as well. It seems to add, it might be a placebo effect, but I feel like I get more control with my aiming. Also clicking down L3 and R3 feels very good, quieter than most other controllers and doesn't rattle around all hollow and tinny in the controller. Cosmetically, I also do like the gloss white inside of the thumbstick bases. But now let's plug the gamepad into the PC and get some technical analysis of these thumbsticks so I can give them a proper grade. Plug it into the PC to run some diagnostics. It's BYOC or bring your own cable day here at Gamer Heaven. I did bring my own and this one actually, funny enough, is also Razer, but not from this controller. You know how I know? It's longer than six inches. Actually, an adequate length. It's 10 foot. This one, I have a little slack to work with. I like that. Both dipsticks in the downward position. We are going wired on the PC. Over here in nothing short of gamepad tester, I don't like what's happening to all of our corneas engage a dark theme real quick. We're talking about a wireless PS5 controller, so it makes sense that it's recognized as a wired Xbox 360 controller. It's the day and age that we live in. Because my ocular cavities got assaulted earlier, the readings I'm seeing here are a sight for sore eyes. Relief that I craved, and this looks great. As I move the left and right analog sticks to and fro, and then I stop, as you're wishing I probably would with the witty quips and whatnot. The horizontal and vertical axes of both the sticks snaps back to a default of 0 0.00002. I think that was enough zero meaning that these thumbsticks are very well calibrated right out of the box, which these are just using potentiometer thumbsticks, probably Alps, that's where all these companies tend to source from, but these are calibrated very well. And also I will say they are buttery smooth. As I'm moving around, every little movement is being picked up here, which I think will be reflected when we test the circularity here. Kinda did, kinda didn't. I mean, I was expecting maybe in the three to four realm, but uh, this'll do, this'll do. Let's go counterclockwise and a little bit slower this time. Okay, not bad, not bad. One more, just to land it on a nice even three. Kevin, that's an odd number. Public school system has failed you. But luckily these thumbsticks haven't failed us. There would be no out of the box stick drift, no adverse aiming issues, and both these seem very responsive. And again, very buttery smooth. But because of a scarce amount of included thumbstick caps, what seems like limited travel when you're at full lock, and a third thing that I can't think of anymore, so it's probably not that important. I'm gonna go ahead and give the thumbsticks a three out of five. Now moving on to bumpers, they are in a good ergonomic position where I wanna naturally rest my hand. I can hit them with the meat. I don't think that's the real term, but this ball right here on the inside of my index finger. However, pressing them with the tip, they have a little bit of an issue as they are kind of on a swivel mechanism. But overall, they feel good. I'm just not a huge fan of the cheap plastics that they decided to go with with this three button suite, the bumpers, triggers, and these additional buttons, M1 and 2. But what I really do like about the bumpers is the fact that they are those mecha tactile switches. So they are mechanical switches and they feel great. They're also not too loud, which I do enjoy. Now, because they don't really have a place to go, I'm gonna go ahead and loop in these additional bumper buttons, M1 and 2, with the bumpers, giving them an overall score of five out of five. I love having two additional buttons in addition to the four on the back. And previous Razer models have had these additional niblets, so I've had time to get used to their placement. And I was worried initially I would hit them accidentally all the time. It really isn't the case. You can hit your bumpers, you can hit your triggers, and then right between them, you have these two additional buttons. Great, five out of five. Triggers are an absolute joy on this controller as they do use trigger stops. However, they're not the trigger stops that extend a little plastic prong or peg to stop the trigger from being pulled. When they are engaged as this side is, it turns into a literal mouse click. That is the entirety of the pull. That's all the travel you're gonna get. To give you an audio sample of that, so also very quiet. So if you're a streamer or YouTuber, you're not really gonna pick up too many of those clicks through your microphone. Face button and D-pad is a different story, a little bit louder. The trigger is very silent. And I feel like you're actually getting less travel with these triggers than a stock PlayStation controller. But the biggest downside to the triggers, a huge big old fat con, is that you no longer have the adaptive triggers to get stiffer or lighter depending on what's going on on screen. Which add to the immersion and are used heavily in Sony Interactive Entertainment titles. So all first party games on PlayStation 5. And in some games like Returnal and Ratchet clank, it's actually a functional feature where you pull down the trigger until you feel resistance and that's a secondary fire mode. And because this is a third party controller that is using their own trigger stop system, this completely removes adaptive triggers. That's a bummer. And that trend unfortunately continues with the haptic feedback. I have never felt more disconnected from my PS5, either of my PS5s, than I do using this controller. This controller fully removes two of the three unique features of a PS5 DualSense controller, that being the adaptive triggers and the haptic feedback. Also, no 
built-in speaker and no built-in microphone, which is nice because if your headset goes down, you're still calmed up with your buddies. You can also use your voice to browse things like Netflix and YouTube instead of having to sit there with the stupid little pop-up keyboard, virtual keyboard. This controller is directly marketed at the PS5. That's its sole main console. A big old oversized PlayStation button, top dead center, whatnot. Part of what makes Sony exclusives so bangerific, such nipple squeezingly awesome good games down to their core foundation would be that they're immersive and the PS5 takes that to a new level because you've got triggers that get stiffer or lighter depending on what's going on on screen. And then of course you've got haptic feedback, which is leagues ahead of these sloppy rumble force vibration motors that we had in previous generation consoles, such as the Xbox One and PS4. There's some B-roll footage overlaid here of a full teardown or disassembly I did of a PS5 DualSense, and you can clearly cosmetically see the visual difference between the modules, but feeling it in gameplay is what is the game changer. And the game has been changed here negatively because there is not only no haptic feedback, but there's no vibration, period. That's fine. A lot of gamers actually prefer no vibration. Cool, we'll move on from that. No adaptive triggers. That's an actual functional feature in a lot of first-party Sony games, such as Returnal and Ratchet and Clank, and cannot be turned off or deactivated. I will caveat that by saying I did play a lot of Rift Apart, Ratchet and Clank, with a controller that had mouse click triggers and had no issues. And you could probably do the same with Returnal. But I'm just, you know, playing devil's advocate here, playing both sides. I've just never felt so emotionally disconnected from my PS5. The controller is the interface between your console. It's what you're touching that's controlling what's going on on screen. And here, I'm not getting any feedback in the form of vibration. The triggers ain't doing shit. Also, oh, forgot this one. There's no speaker on board, like every other PS4 and 5 controller has built in. Hearing stuff coming out of the speaker. And yeah, all these seem kind of gimmicky, but when you put them all together, it really does create an immersive controller, like we've seen with the PS4 DualShock and the PS5 DualSense. And I just feel so disconnected from my games using this $250 controller because it's aimed directly at the PS5. People ain't buying this for PC. I, we know that because guess what? They can get a $100 controller that wires up to their PC and does the same thing. Feels the same, has the same rear buttons because you got a $250 controller with no carrying case, minimal included accessories that doesn't have adaptive triggers, haptic feedback, vibration of any means, and ergonomically feels not great in the hands. Also, you can't wake up your console with this controller. So get your steps in, make sure you have your Fitbit on walking from the couch to your console to turn that bitch on. I am proud to announce that you can use wired headphones wirelessly connected. You know what I mean? I mean, you can plug in your wired headset and have this bad boy connected via that hyperspeed dongle to your PS5 and it streamed the audio just fine. There was no humming or buzzing, volume seemed fine. And you could also use your inline microphone and mute it from the controller. The only complaint I did have is it did have kind of a filter over it, kind of an audio filter where it sounded like everything was kind of like Turtle Beach supersonic hearing when you engage that where it cuts out all the frequencies except for the mid range where footsteps should be. It just sounded like everything was artificially pumped in in the mid range and sounded a little weird but it didn't sound scratchy or staticky or anything. And it had me scratching my head. Is it my, my earbuds I'm testing with or what's going on here? But it does work with the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. We need to change camera angles so you can see me grip the back of the haunches here for rear buttons or back paddles. In this case, they're rear buttons. Funky, funky buttons. Much like the ergonomics of this controller, it is virtually identical to the previous Razer Chroma for Xbox, which is an interesting story and one that I don't think can be told at surface value just by looking at it, judging a book by its cover. Because if I saw this book on the shelves of a Barnes and Noble or something, I would just keep walking. I would probably actually never return to that category or section of the store because they look freakishly uncomfortable. They look silly to me. They look stupid. They look like they're not going to be ergonomically comfortable whatsoever because you want buttons or paddles, either buttons sunken in flush with the shell or maybe some paddles right here. But these ones are right in the middle. So in order to use them, you have to extend your fingers out like this, meaning that you can cover all four of them simultaneously. And this is actually more comfortable than it looks. I will say in long gaming sessions, meaning for me, anything over three hours with this controller, I do notice a little bit of fatigue in the knuckles here because they have been extended out like this. You don't need to like dislocate your fingers to use this by any means. Probably would help but you don't need to. As with the previous controllers, I am not a fan of the plastics they went with. It is incredibly cheap. There's also a lot of wiggle or play in these bottom paddles side to side, which is just gross. One positive note, they are very quiet. 
a downside. They're not removable. However, since they are up and out of the way, if you're sharing this with somebody that doesn't use rear buttons or you are playing a game that doesn't need rear buttons, you just hold it like this and you totally forget about the fact that this has four rear buttons. How do you rear bind them rear buttons? This is a new thing. I like to splice words together. So instead of saying rebind the rear buttons, you know, do your button mappings, what face buttons you want on the rear buttons. I don't have time for both the words. So we're going rear bind. Unfortunately, you can't rear bind on the fly like virtually every other custom controller. So you have to do it on a literal trash wagon cell phone app for iOS or Android, which we are going to do a full tour walkthrough in the next section. That in combination with this funky ergonomic design, I'm gonna give the rear buttons a two out of five. They're usable, they are serviceable, and if you are an owner of this controller, you will get used to it over time and get proficient and even good with them. But having tested so many other rear paddle and button designs, this just ain't it. Just from an R&D standpoint, I mean, just looking at it, feeling it, smelling it, touching it, tasting it, this is not a good rear button design. The software suite, which is actually a phone application, gross. You need to make any tweaks on your controller is available in the Apple Store as well as the Google Play Store. It's this one right here, sporting a robust 2.4 out of five stars due to it being a wonky mess. I've used it in the past with other controllers. And since you can't rebind the rear buttons or do any settings changes without this phone app, you have to use it. For sure docking points for that. Once you get the application, you will be prompted to allow Bluetooth on your phone. Sorry about all the oils and grease on my phone. There's no instructions for getting set up with the app, so I'll provide that service. Click on add controller. It'll ask you to connect what controller you have. We have the V2 Pro. It will tell you exactly what you need to do to put the controller in pairing mode. You're gonna hold down the multi-function and mic mute button for five seconds. Now it doesn't say this, but you do need to turn the dip switch to wireless mode and then power on the controller with the PlayStation button before you can hold down these two buttons to put her into pairing mode for God's sake. You will get a blue light flashing rapidly around the touchpad. On your phone, press next. And if there is a God above, it will recognize. Put the dirt bike up on the maintenance jacks for a little bit while I change out the rear sprocket. Also gonna put on my pop socket for mobility. So you do have four onboard profiles, which are swappable on the fly. No, they're not. No, you won't. No, it can't. Nowhere in the instruction manual that I saw does it explain how to use this profile switch button. I've tried double tapping it, single tapping it, long pressing it, and I've not been able to switch the profiles on the fly. It seems to me like you need to launch the phone app and then you are able to tap on screen to select the four profiles and it will tell you successful binding and it will actually show the color of the profile underneath the touchpad, green, blue, red, etc. But if you have to launch the phone app to change the profiles, you can't really change profiles on the fly, meaning this profile switch button is pointless. Anybody else confused here? Now default's gonna be shooter, fighting, sports, and racing, but of course I do advise you set up your own custom profiles. We'll use shooter as our candidate. Clicking on the three dots will allow you to rename the profile. Actually clicking on the name allows you to modify it. You have your key bindings for M1 and 2, which are the two extra bumpers, and then of course the four rear buttons. When you click on one of them, you will have a breakdown of all the buttons you can remap to, and you can completely unassign the button if you want it disabled as well. You do also have a feature called sensitivity clutch, which I've seen with previous Razer controllers. I've talked about it then, talk about it now. I'm not a big fan of it. I think it serves no purpose. What it does is kind of a sniping mode where you hold down a button, one of the rear buttons, and while you have that held down, the sensitivity of the right analog stick is significantly cut down. That's actually not doing you any favors if you're trying to get better at first person shooters, because anytime you use any controller that doesn't have that clutch feature, which is only on a few Razer models, then you're screwed because you didn't learn how to actually modulate your thumb control. Plus you're also giving up one of your remappable buttons to be dedicated to that slow sensitivity mode. That's dumb. And I've asked around and uh, nobody really seems to be using the clutch mode much. I'm sure somebody out there does, just nobody I've encountered. But you have that here and you can assign it to the left or right stick and adjust your sensitivity with a slider. Chroma is of course gonna be the RGB control. Tapping on the controller does nothing. Click on open chroma effects. And over here in the bottom right, you're gonna click on the global icon and you can completely deactivate the lights. Static is going to be one constant color. And you do have a radial wheel, which is in real time as you can see it is adjusting the controller granted pretty slowly it fades to the new color, but it is reflected in real time. And you also have a separate slider for color intensity. Spectrum is gonna be rotating through the entire RGB spectrum and breathing is gonna fade in and out with one color. So really not a whole heck of a lot of control in that application. You can adjust things like thumbstick dead zones or sensitivity curves, response curves, if you will. You can't set up macros. Really all you can do and what you need the application for is to rebind the rear buttons and top two buttons for that matter. But once you use the application once to do that, set up your four 
Core Profiles, you could technically uninstall it from your phone. I'm gonna give the software suite, or in this case, it really should be a software suite, to be honest. You should be able to control this controller on PC via Chroma. It'd be great if you could just control the controller in that, you can. This app also sucks pretty bad, 1.5 out of five. And the fact that you need it too, to actually rebind the buttons, because you can't do it on the fly, one out of five. Time for a little points revision. I'm actually going to go ahead and give the app a zero out of five. In fact, if I could remove points, I would. I've had it crash on me twice and disconnect from the controller more than two times. To roll into a little lime green mini rant over here, your other software programs suck as well. As for the connection modes with this controller, it might seem super complicated, but it's really not. If you want to play with it wired, you're going to use a USB-C cable, plug that into the USB-A sock hole of your console or PC, and have the dip switch on the back set to wired, and then whatever platform you're on. PlayStation 5 or PC. Same thing for wireless. When you turn the controller into its wireless mode, it will start using the internal battery and you can turn the controller on by pressing the PlayStation button for a few seconds. Then sure enough, you guessed it, you're gonna put that dip switch into PS5 or PC, depending on what platform you are. And you're gonna use the hyperspeed dongle on your PC or console. As for battery life, three hours gets you to a full charge, which is indicative of a stock PS5 controller. However, what's not on par is gonna be the battery life. It's actually quite a bit better, especially if you turn off the RGB lighting. You're getting 10 hours hours of battery life with the Chroma RGB on, which is actually a couple more hours than you'll squeeze out of a stock controller, but you're getting 28 hours out of a charge if you can turn off that RGB, which trust me, you can because you're not seeing it because your hand is blocking most of it anyway. Let's test the stock input lag or delay or delag if you've been around the channel a while by running X input test to test the refresh slash polling rate. I'm going to move the left analog stick around in a circle. I do have a full tutorial on what the hell I'm doing right now and how to overclock a controller as well. That is linked in the description below. Oh boy, although this controller doesn't really seem to need much attention right out of the box. The first pull, the first run out of the gate, 1.93 milliseconds and consistent as all hell with a 0.9 on the minimum and a 3.2 on the maximum. Under one millisecond of jitter, this is just a freaking beast. She's pretty quick and why that is, is we're looking at about a 500 hertz stock polling rate. I'd like to run a couple more tests with the patient, please. Oh, what, what, what? Uh-oh, what happened? A broker. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I was about to say, we got such good results on the last one, a broker. Well, she is as consistent as the Gamer Heaven upload schedule. Never mind, that's not a good point of reference. These are consistent, though. I'm giving stock to lag five out of five because there's not much of it to be seen. Now that dipstick is in wireless and PC, you're seeing her in every configuration on this video. To turn this controller on, you have to hold down that power button for about five seconds at minimum, as opposed to every other PS5 controller or Xbox or shit, any other console I can think of where you just press the home button and it wakes it up. You gotta hold the sucker down for a while. Awesome, so we are connected with that hyperspeed wireless adapter now and let's run a test here. Nice, so with the wireless dongle, we're getting four milliseconds of input lag or delay with a 250 hertz polling rate. That's not bad. We're also going to try and overclock wirelessly too. I know it sounds crazy. We're going to try it. So there's the final numbers. You're getting in the low twos wired and you're getting in the high threes wirelessly. So unless you're some kind of a competitive esports athlete with G Fuel dripping off the mustache, for most casual players, I would advise just using that wireless dongle for the convenience of being wireless. And you're only getting an extra one, 1 1.5 milliseconds of delay, which is virtually indistinguishable to most human eyeballs. To most balls, they would not notice the difference, I tell you. But we are wired again and we're going to go into the lord of mice overclocking software we're going to overclock this beast we are recognized in wired mode as an xbox 360 controller for windows not being filtered currently so let's go ahead and remedy that highlight it install service yeah okay change the default to 1000 install service open filter on device mm, please do unplug replug and that's about as overclocked as an overclock can get which should net you one millisecond of input lag or delay let's see if that's the case let's see if there's any tangible measurable proof of the work that we just put in mm -hmm. negative Seems to be polling rate locked. Let's try a couple more. So absolutely can confirm that it looks like this controller is polling rate locked at 500 hertz. That in, that's the end of that story. Or is it? I'm going to try and overclock wirelessly to the hyperspeed dongle. So with that wireless dongle, we are recognized as an Xbox 360 controller, this time not being filtered as we're not overclocked on this method, only wired. And this time we're going wireless. Let's try and overclock that dongle, this wireless method, if you will. Now's about the time we would unplug and replug. But what we're going to do is turn off the controller, unplug the dongle, replug the dongle, turn the controller back on and it does look as if it is reflected sick that's an overclock that's a wireless overclock actually with cheese did it do anything i'm gonna call it now and say no if it was pulling rate locked wired it probably is pulling rate locked wirelessly as well but who knows 
I do. Me. I, I knew. I called it. Yeah, same thing here. 250 hertz. I'll run a couple more just for the, just for safe measure. Bam. Lemon juice my clam. There was no results from overclocking. I didn't really think there would be. So the pros, cons, and verdict. Unfortunately, this is my second time recording this. I just had to delete a 20 minute clip because for some reason it had some audio filter over it where I sounded like a woman or at least it was high pitch or something. I don't know. But luckily take two is going to be right on the money because all the thoughts are still right there, fresh on the brain. I usually like to start with the cons because the internet loves negativity. However, we're going to start with the pros this time because unfortunately there's less of them. And I'm also going to seamlessly tie the cons into my verdict. As I list all of these pros, keep in the back of your mind that all of these transfer over to this $100 controller. I actually see it on sale at Amazon for about 80 bucks constantly because it's an older model. But pretty much all the pros or features I'm going to praise transfer over to the entire Razer lineup, whether it's the Wolverine series series for Xbox or the Raiju for PS4. So this controller that is 80 to $150 more expensive than its brother and sister lineup shares damn near the same features. Keep that in the back of your tuckus or your mind. The 8-way micro switch D-pad feels fantastic. It's rated for millions of clicks. I've rated it a 5 out of 5 for a reason. It's great. Same thing with the face or action buttons, the mecha tactile buttons from Razer. I've praised them for years. I've tested mechanical or digital face buttons from other controller companies such as AIM, and Razer has always pulled ahead. That's no different here. I absolutely love the on-off triggers, the fact that it is a digital mouse-like click when you engage the trigger stops rather than just a plastic bar that comes out to stop the trigger from being pulled all the way. I love that you have the two additional bumpers. Having the versatility of having six programmable buttons rather than four is awesome. And I think the RGB looks kind of cool when it's just sitting out on your desk or something. Granted, when you grab the controller, it covers most of the RGB. And in the long run, I would recommend turning it off because you're going to save a ton of battery life. Now onto the cons, shortcomings are areas of improvement. And unfortunately, there is a surplus. You're sacrificing or removing a lot of features that the stock controller has and is utilized in a lot of games such as the haptic feedback, adaptive triggers, onboard speaker, and the ability to wake up your console from sleep mode. Also, the fact there is no carrying case yet there is included accessories that could easily get lost, one of which is a dongle that you need to actually use the controller, and there's no place to store that dongle. No cool compartment built into the back of the controller, no cheap carrying case, nothing. Following in line with that, the packaging was actually surprising how crappy it was. Not just from Razer, but any $250 consumer goodie. Should have more of a premium unboxing experience. Next up, I honestly expected far faster speeds from the hyperspeed wireless dongle. We were getting in the high threes to low fours, generally around 3.8 milliseconds of input lag or delay wirelessly, which isn't bad, but I honestly expected to be getting closer to two or even in the ones, maybe the high ones. This by no means is out of the realm of possibility considering in a previous video, using DS4 window, I was able to overclock the Bluetooth capabilities of a DualShock controller to get two milliseconds of input lag or delay wirelessly wirelessly to my PC. And that's with Bluetooth, so this balls deep hyperspeed 2.4 gigahertz technology, super hyped, pumped, marketed, and inflated, should absolutely be faster than Bluetooth. And in my testing here, it simply wasn't. And since that is the connection method that you will be using on PS5, since you're not using the usual Bluetooth method, you have to use that dongle. It also puts this controller in a weird place for support because you're not getting controller updates from Sony, like you're usually prompted when you sync up a new controller. But from what I saw from that shitty phone application, there was no way to flash an update or a firmware patch to this controller, I could be mistaken. It just doesn't seem like this controller has a whole lot of software support for it to get better over time. And I really wish there was an application you could install on the PS5 like there have been for previous Razer controllers. And if you're using this on PC, you should absolutely be able to use the Razer Synapse app, which integrates all of the Razer PC peripherals. The warranty at one year, it's not the worst thing we've ever seen, but I'd like to see at least three years, especially for a $250 controller. Then we get to the biggest problem, and that is the fact that this controller simply isn't ergonomically comfortable in the hand. The shell design was okay, it was simply acceptable with the Wolverine V2 Chroma. However, with the Pro over here, the bottom of the controller is substantially thicker since this is now a wireless controller, and it just doesn't feel great in the hand. And that continues when you realize, wow, there's actually four rear buttons here, but I gotta cock out my fingers like this and get early onset arthritis in order to use them. It does create a lot of knuckle fatigue when you have your fingers extended like this, instead of being able to just grip the controller naturally. The fact you only have four included thumbsticks and there really is no high option. And it feels like you have limited range of motion with the analog sticks because you have large anti-friction rings and then these extremely thick thumbstick shafts. It makes you feel like you have limited range of motion. 
that's the opposite of what you want. For me, when I'm reviewing a controller, I always sign off with the verdict, the most important point being price to performance, bang for buck, or the overall value of the controller. And simply put, it is not good with the Razer Wolverine V2 Pro. Hyperspeed Wireless is touted as being a benefit over Bluetooth, showed zero benefit whatsoever in practical testing on PlayStation 5 or PC. Actually, if I'm playing on PC with an overclock, I can get Bluetooth 5.0 faster than the hyperspeed dongle for this controller. You're stripping or removing a ton of standard features that come on a stock Sony controller, and since this is only usable on PlayStation 5 and PC, chances are you own a PS5 if you're spending $250 on this controller. Hopefully, I, I hope to baby Jesus on the manger that you've seen this review prior to actually pulling the trigger on that purchase, and maybe you stumble upon my controller playlist and you start watching a bunch of pro controller reviews, custom premium controller reviews, and you it opens your eyes and your took us to the wide world of pro controllers out there. This simply isn't it. For example, I just reviewed the Hyper Controller HYPR, which for $180 is incredibly ergonomic, has four remappable rear buttons, mechanical triggers and bumpers, six swappable thumbstick caps, and rubberized grips for $180. And if you're on PC with an overclock, you can get that to under one millisecond of input lag or delay. As awesome as some of the individual components are, like the mecha tactile switches and the eight-way mechanical D-pad and these extra niblets on top, it does not warrant the $250 price point. In fact, I would say if this was a $180 controller, putting it right in line, eye to eye, nip to nip with the new Victrix BFG, which I'm about to be reviewing in the near future, as well as Sony's first party controller, the DualSense Edge, as well as a ton of the pro premium and custom controllers I've already reviewed on this channel, it's not looking good for the Wolverine V2 Pro. I will keep you apprised of any changes or if my opinion immediately veers and shifts and changes, and this is the dopest pro controller I've ever had in my hands, just seems like a lot of missed opportunities from Razer. And also incredible incredibly expensive for what it is. Ergonomically, not very comfortable. If you enjoyed the video, liking it helps it to get seen by more gamers. This information will reach and assist them as well, which in turn helps me grow this little channel, which I do greatly appreciate. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover news in the gaming community and industry, tutorials helping you get set up streaming and YouTubing, as well as honest gaming product reviews, keyboards, mice, headsets, controllers, mics, chairs, etc. There are some hefty exclusive discount codes found only in the description of my videos and only for the audience here at Gamer Heaven. I have links to all my other platforms and so socials in the description below. To get in touch with myself and the stallions and stallionettes of Gamer Heaven, join the community discord and check me out at twitch.tv where I go live every other leap year on a blue moon if it falls into an odd calendar number and my pH balance is on point. Just kidding. Starting June, I'm going to be live streaming a lot. Thanks for watching. This has been AK40 Kevin hosting Gamer Heaven and I'll see you tomorrow because I upload daily all the time, 60% of the time, sometimes, most of the time. Peace.